Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me just fine? Not so so, huh? Get the volume up. Um, if anyone here is dying to see Todd Zimmerman, I'm unfortunately going to have to let you know he's not uh, part of this panel. It's a little bit of a mistake in the uh, brochure. So if you're run, got, got to walk out, um, that's okay. I, we, we're going to try to live up to the level of the panels he typically gives. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and we apologize for the uh, mistake in the brochure. My name is Brian O'Looney. I'm can't hear us at all. All right, let's try that. All right. All right. So I'm Brian Aluni with Torty Gallison Partners. Um, uh, you are here for multifamily for an enhanced public realm. We're going to cover the issues that you see on the screen here today. Uh, with me is Jamie Gorski, who is a, uh, a, gr a graduate of Ohio State University with a degree in mathematical theory. And she's taken that and used that to uh, look into the marketing for a number of housing firms, uh, national housing firms, a, a number of which are based in the Washington market. Kettle, he, she was at Kettler, then uh, moved on to uh, Charles E. Smith, which got bought out and became Archstone Smith. And now she is the vice president, senior vice president of marketing for Bazudo. And with that, I'm going to let her take it from here. Thank you, Brian. As Brian said, I'm a senior vice president of corporate marketing with the Bazudo Group. And so I have about 30 years of experience and mainly multifamily. The Bazudo Group has six different divisions. And so what I'm going to talk about mostly today is one division, and that's multifamily development and property management. And our footprint is from Boston to the DC area. So we have 120 properties and we have about 32,000 units. And so I'm just giving you a glimpse of really our portfolio and what we see and what we see a glimpse of the future. But let's start with the observation that the consumer arena is now inhabited by experienced, well-informed consumers. They expect the best of the best, and that's in every service, and every product and every experience. And so when we are looking at designing buildings, it's important for us to really break the mold and to create something different. So as an industry, look, we look in the wrong place. We focus on replacement cost, cap rates, the cost of capital, and we lose focus on the most important driver, and that's the emotional connection. So it's through design, and innovation that we can cultivate these new emotional connections and turn what we build into well-received communities. So how do you feel when you see this? Does it feel nice? When you look at these images, they should inspire you, inspire you to build better product. I look at this, who's familiar with this product? Do you like it or not? Many don't like it. The views are amazing. Did you go out in the balcony? <laughs> and it was scary because of height or scary because of wind? Hmm. It's quite fun. When they looked at this, they wanted to make sure that they maximized the views, of course. They've got the water views, this is in Chicago. They've got the water views, they've got the Chicago downtown views, and they want to sh make sure that they maximize that. They also wanted to make sure that you could enjoy the balconies longer because of the climate, because of the wind, and so because of the curves, the wind curves around. So I think it's quite a good example in some respect because they broke the mold. I mean, it's 474 units, it's 87 stories, and tall, and it has 80,000 square feet of amenities outdoor, 32,000 square, square feet indoor, which I'm not going to give you the list because we wouldn't have time. But I do think that they actually, they did break the mold. So today's renter. This is from our portfolio. So the average age is 36, 
Household income, you know, close to 80,000, 1.7. Look at how many have pets. And that's only growing. And so our, you know, it used to be we'd say renters 25 to 35, that's our sweet point, not any longer. You know, it's definitely 25 to 45, and that continues to rise. So, and we also know about the home ownership rates tumbling and that um, the loss of middle class wealth and home ownership, people don't want to buy, they're burdened with debt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they want a more transient lifestyle. But it is, it's becoming really um, what people want to do. You know, I spoke to Dr. Goss. Anybody know Dr. Goss from Virginia Tech? She does a study on housing. She actually runs a property management degree program out of Virginia Tech. And she studies housing across the world. And she was talking about that this is the preferred choice, not only with the renter, the Gen Y of today, but also those, instead of buying second homes, they don't want to buy second homes anymore. They want to rent. And so with Gen Y, you know, close to 77.4 million, 20% of our population, 20% live with their parents. Well-educated, independent, tech-savvy, multicultural, civic-minded, pampered, and tattooed. That's a good point. So we need to pay attention to them. The next 10 years of our industry are based on their wants and whims. And again, there's 77 million. So yesterday's product, suburban, not necessarily near public transportation, less exotic amenities, spacious apartments, lots of closet space, uh, that's still a demand. Lower end finishes, they really didn't care if they had the space. Kitchens and living rooms, they were separate, uh, less open, more defined. Amenity spaces were compartmentalized. Um, do you remember those huge clubhouses? You'd walk in and nobody used them. There would be these big grand spaces. And then you'd walk down room to room to room. Here's your fitness, here's your playroom, here's whatever. So for today, they're willing to sacrifice the space, but they want high-end finishes. Again, we talked about that they want the best of the best. So they want flexible layouts. So these movable walls, movable islands, those are still a hit. They want hotel-type amenities. They're used to living this way. And they want common area spaces for socializing. It's funny, everybody talks about, do I do a business center? And do I have like this click cafe? They already have their own computers. Yes, you do it. You do it because they want to socialize. They're going to bring down maybe their iPad, but they want other people around. Or they might have a Mac, they just want to go downstairs, whatever it is. They want a place to socialize. The green lifestyle, that's important. They expect it. They're not going to pay for it yet. That might change. Technology is important. Um, no dining rooms again. Dens are popular. Storage is important, especially bike storage. And they expect the green. So with design, this is a new product in DC. What I like about it, of course, is look at how beautiful the finish is. Look that the cabinets run to the top. Look at the island that you actually can put some stools underneath. I love these islands you can't sit at. It's like we don't build dining rooms, but we don't build an island that they can actually sit at. So this design is good. And this is a very small apartment. So this is one today that has the movable island. Again, very well received. This one's actually in Reston, Virginia. So they expect, again, great kitchens, you know, great finishes, great cabinets, great fixtures. Keyless entry is important. How many have seen this? Okay. Have you used it? Do you like it? Yes. I think this is great. Lose your keys, who cares? Do you have your phone? If you lose your phone, it could be a problem. <laughs> what do you think about this? I say, don't do it. Exactly. Technology is changing so quickly. As soon as you put this in, it's outdated. You know, it's so it's a you know, it's an, they can put their i you know their iPhone or their iPod, but maybe they're using an iPad. I mean, maybe there's something else coming. There's two things in here that are semi outdated. One is definitely outdated. Can you guess? What? 
Ooh, I wasn't even thinking of that. You're right. <laughs> That's even worse. Well, the other is, you see that the off of the desk in the corner? That's not well received either. Now, having a commuter station where they can walk in and put their iPad and their phones and charge everything, that's great. And creating a cool little nook for that, all over it. The other is the wine rack. They, want, they like the little wine coolers. So these two products, sorry for the blurriness in that photo, both in the same submarket. One was built in 1996, and one just, just leased up. So the, the one on the left-hand side was Regent's Park, and this was the most popular floor plan. A two-bedroom, 1,245 square feet. Look at that kitchen, closed in. Look at the banjo tops in the bathroom. Look at the fireplace kind of encroaching on the room. You got your separate washer and dryer, your separate dining room. Now this is Halstead Square's most popular apartment. A one bedroom. Great kitchen, movable island, the washer and dryer, you know, it's stack. It's compact, still has lots of closet space. You see linen, you see a foyer closet. But that, that small, wonderful little apartment. You know, the other thing about Gen Y, as we said, 20% are living with their family, but they're living a nice life. Or even their student housing. Some of that student housing is nice. And guess what? The vast majority of them have never had a roommate. So the one bedrooms and studios, very popular. Monroe Street Market is a product that we're developing and deliver in 2013. But the average square footage is 790, which is about 22% smaller than what you saw at Regents Park, which was our product. So we're already going 22% smaller. And then we have other product. In fact, one of them that we manage is 360 State in New, ha New Haven. And it's 638 square feet is the average square footage. And so who's seen these? The micro suites in Vancouver? Anybody seen them? Nice? What I like about this is it, it really is so compact. What I also like is that they interviewed some customers and it was, it was well received because they had the right location. They didn't want to share. They wanted to have their own space. I mean, basically it looks like that they went to a, somebody who designed boats and figured it out and then put it in this apartment. But still, I think, I think they're well received. Jamie, the other thing about that is, can you hear me on this? A good chunk of that is illegal in this country because of ADA. Okay, amenities. This is from Jay Turner Research. And so basically they asked an open-ended question. What is value? What does value mean to you when prospects are seeking apartments? 21% said amenities. Now, I found that kind of surprising. I expected more on this location and other things. It was amenities. So lobbies are important. This is one of our brand new suburban um, communities, garden. I mean, even that is grand. And this is in Washington, D.C. This is the avenue. How many have seen this? This is in New York. This is a hotel. This is Crosby Hotel. If you have a chance, go. I think it's a great example because we want to delight our customers. And when you walk in here, you're delighted. The art, just the openness, it's just its so much fun. And that's what we need to be doing. So fitness centers, still the number one amenity. Every study says it. It's if you only have enough money to do one amenity, build your fitness center. So this I like because of the height. And this is really, this has no height. But what I like is they did a nice design. You still want to come there. But these are examples of what's being done today. OK, this is in Washington, DC. This is the Archstone new product that's delivering. 8,000 square feet, pretty big. That green wall, they call it the oxygen wall. I don't know why, <laughs> other than it's got green growing. Gives off oxygen. But the amenities package is phenomenal. And the fitness, again, they're just getting bigger and better. I like this because you can actually you plug it in the wall and you're generating electricity while you're working out. 
This is the Equinox, and this is at MEMA, this is in New York. It's 8,000 square feet, 18,000 square feet. So again, just wonderful experiences with the fitness center, and that's important for you to pay attention to. Pets, we talked about it. Close to 21% of just our portfolio. And they, they pamper their pets. They do. So this is an example of what's being done in a garden apartment community. So it's a dog washing station, and it's really well received. This is a dog run in New York. MEMA has a dog city, and what they did is they had some space in the back, and they created this um, area they called Dog City, and they had one of their dog walkers who comes in and actually now runs her business out of there. So they didn't charge her any rent. She came in. She offers services. She takes care of the dogs. Well, you know, it has all this, these pieces of equipment so the dogs can have fun. The vet comes twice a week. They do grooming. Club rooms. Have you been here? Ace Hotel in New York. I think this is a good example to show you another design that's really well received. If you walk into this hotel, it is always busy. It's fun, it's vibrant, there's so many different places you can socialize with others. There's this big table in the middle and you'll see people just sitting there with their computers. You'll see people sitting all over. The restaurant's great, it's just, it, again, a pleasant place to be. And I like that the design is different. These are some of the club rooms that we've done recently. This is, again, the Avenue in Washington, D.C. But you can see it's not, you know, all those different rooms. I mean, it's like one grand space, and you can just go wherever you'd like. What do you think of this? It's nice. It's not as well received. It's sort of like it's almost dated now. It's almost like they want, they want that Ace Hotel. It's, it's changing. And this I like just because of the ping pong table. It's not ours. But that's an amenity that people actually like too. So South by Southwest, which is the big conference for music and film um, and interactive, one of the um, fun things that was happening is FedEx was walking around and this woman, you could charge everything from her, you know, see so your phones and, you know, which was great because what are you always looking for? A place to charge. The same thing happens with us in our community. So we go wireless, but then they need to plug in. And so what happens is they start unplugging the lamps, like in the, you know, in the lobbies, and they start moving furniture. So we have to pay attention to that. We, we need to give them places. And there is furniture today. There's some couches actually that are really quite nice. This is an idea, and we're actually doing this, but this is not quite the design. But what it is is because now you've gone small. You've gone so small, it's hard for them to entertain. And so you need a place that they can have a dinner party. But not just the old table and some chairs and not much to it. It has to have life and excitement. And so this is like an entertaining suite. You can have your friends over from dinner. Uh, back to Archstone, again, this new product that they're delivering in D.C. This is just a running list of what they have, a click cafe, the cinema. They have a um, demonstration kitchen, but it's a real demonstration kitchen. It's just not a kitchen that we all say you could have a chef come in. This was designed by a chef. Um, they also have the pet salon. They have a fridge so that you can get groceries delivered sports club, they have a lounge, they even have a jam room, a music room. And then the wheelhouse, it's stocked with tools and supplies so you can maintain your bike. So pools, also really important. And it's not necessarily about swimming, as you know. It's socializing, it's hanging out. I love this because it's got the monument. This is great, this is a small, this is not our job, this is JBG's. Pool is still very important, yes. So fitness is the number one. Pool's usually right there. So this I like because it's very small. It's only got like 12 lounge chairs, but it's just beautifully designed. This just, you know, all this is is again, it's a place to socialize. I'm a swimmer, so I don't really necessarily like this, but this is what they want. 
And this I like just because, again, it's just the beauty of the design. I mean, those are pretty basic, nice chairs, but look at the lamps. Look at the lighting. And this I actually went to. I actually had a margarita here. It's in Cabo. But it's nice. Again, it's, it creates something different with your pool experience. The lighting's important as well. And this is an alternative. So it's not a pool. It's sort of this little fountain. Those chairs are in the water, and those are a little deck. Outdoor living, very important. This is actually in Miami, Midtown um, Miami. And what I like about this is look what happens on the outside. They've taken that chunk out of the building, and it makes it such a wonderful draw when you're going by. And this I love, too, because it's this wonderful outdoor area that when you walk outside, it's just, it's got lights, and it's got lanterns hanging, it's got this great little furniture, it's like the secret little garden. So create those wonderful outdoor spaces. This, the table's great. Again, these are just examples of this, how, and this is another important amenity. The grilling is important, places to sit and eat, the fire pit, place to socialize outdoor kitchens, and this is great. They've got the spin bikes, you know, you come out and exercise. And again, that lighting is just terrific. Outdoor theaters, you know, this is a small one, which I like, it's kind of in the courtyard. You can see it's just a little bit of seating, but this wonderful courtyard, and then you've got the theater. Business centers, still important, offering coffee, a place to socialize, that's what they want. Media rooms, um, again, give them something that's exciting about the media room. Again, it's a social place. We use Apple TV or other devices so that it's already loaded with movies and makes it easy for them. A guest suite. We think it's important now, again, you've made small units. So when you make small units, they want to have somebody over, it's important to have a guest suite. And we include a pet bed in the guest suite because, again, you know, it's big on pets. Spas are still important. We're seeing more children. So, and we expect that to rise. It's always been that when they got school age that they would move out and they would go into the suburbs to have better schools. Now they're finding they want to live there. They like this lifestyle. Tasting rooms with the wine tasting. The mail rooms, you need to pay attention to your mail rooms. With this, we use a, a building link, which is sort of your on-site concierge. It tells you about packages, other notification of what's going on in the building. But you should, this is not well designed. This is one of ours. I mean, you need a great place to put that up. Leasing centers. It, it always surprises me how we don't do a good job because we're in a perpetual sales process. You know, we do these wonderful, beautiful sales centers for new homes. And then it comes to the leasing, and we usually don't do such a nice experience, and we're the ones that are constantly releasing. So you need to pay attention to that. And with it, though, you have to not use the technology that we did in the before, and you, it's the same. It's, like, it's almost like the kiosks are outdated, so don't do the kiosks. Don't do graphics. You want wonderful spaces, and we're really relying on iPads. This is, I this is JFK, which I like because it's got the iPads, and that's what we're doing in our next place, is we're actually putting the iPads out in certain locations. And that way they can actually self-serve, get more information if we're busy. But we can also walk around with iPads, too, and give them the information that they like or they, that they need. Uh, this is an example of a prototype store for Limited that was done in Pennsylvania in June. And what they wanted to do is take the offline experience and bring it into the store or the online experience, excuse me, and bring it into the store. And so basically they wanted to make it easy. So when you walked in and you had been shopping online, it would show all the things that you, wanted to, you were interested in, and they would have them in a fitting room so you could try them on immediately. It's that sort of thought that we need to put into our leasing centers. We know they've been to our websites. We know they've looked at all of our information. So when they walk in, we've got to make that as fast as possible. They've already seen all that. What are you interested in? How do we make sure that we take that offline experience and bring it into the sales center and create better sales centers? So green, as we talked about, is um, they expect it. So this was a study done by Satisfax 
It was with 20 different management companies and over 100,000 units across the country, all different types of housing, all different price range. So it's kind of interesting. It shows you what environmental related features are important. And this was a scale of one to five. So of course they want to walk, um, you know, have walkability, environmentally friendly appliances and systems. Um, and it goes on, it gives you some ideas. What was surprising to me is actually Zipcar was really low. In our urban location, Zipcar is really high. And I think part of that has to do with, they did this across the country. Some people probably don't even know what Zipcar is. Um, so I do think if you did it in different markets, you would have um, different results. And then when you look at Energy Star and Green Building uh, Lead and then the National Green Building Standard, what do you think the customers know? Lead? Energy Star. They know Energy Star. It's the world's most recognized green program. They don't necessarily know Lead. Lead was more office. And so we're, we're worried about you know, telling the right story. That's why, again, that study before, it showed like the, en the environmentally friendly appliances. Again, it goes to Energy Star. And so for us, we're trying to make sure that we tell the right story, that we make sure that if we have Energy Star, we get that out there. And then also tell them more about LEED and the National Green Building Standard. Have you seen this, where Honda created some smart homes? I love this, because if we can't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And Honda's out there. These are prototype homes in Japan. But it'll be interesting to see what they do and for us to actually learn from them. And I'm sure you've seen this, the thermostat. What's different about this is it actually learns from you how you live so you have savings. And that's been some of the other problems with the programmable thermostats is that if you don't program them right, you're not going to have the savings. This I like in the home, um, you know, when we're selling a home, we talk more about the savings you'll see and this performance rating. We don't do enough of it in multifamily. And so part of the reason I think that we don't see the returns on the green is that we don't tell the story correctly. So the green um, charging stations we put in ours, we get those for free, but we are giving up a space. We use Zipcar, it's very well received. We also use cars to go Are you familiar with cars to go The difference between Zipcar and cars to go is Zipcar, you have a designated space. Cars to go you could pick it up and you could drop it off someplace else and leave it there. You don't have to bring it back to where you, you took it. So it's nice for us because we don't have to give them designated spaces. And so, but we can, we'll give discount, discounts to our residents. We work with Capital Bike Share. This is a wonderful amenity. We try to get these in front of our buildings if possible. If not, we actually work with other companies so that we have loaner bikes and then they will come and maintain our bikes. And the storage is important. They don't like this storage. They have very expensive bikes. So we have to pay attention to that storage. This was actually in Korea, which it has 25 to 35 bikes that can be stored on there. And having these bike fix-it stations that are vending machines, another good idea. Gardens are important, and they're becoming more important. We had these a while ago. I think it was in the 80s. And now there's sort of this resurgence. And that's up on the roof, as the rooftops of high-rises as well. Have you seen this, the beehives? It's mainly to populate, you know, repopulate bees. But it's some of the high rises, high rises are putting the beehives on top. Uh, one of them is Park Place, which is located in Annapolis. And it's, um, the chef actually goes up, and he, he does harvest the honey, and then he also has his garden. But we're doing it in high rises as well. So for suburban versus urban, there's not that much different. They still want these incredible amenities. The difference is still maybe the design and the size. It's not quite as small as the urban location, but the amenities are just as lovely. This I put in here because of the shower and to remind me that that's something else that they like. You don't have to do a bathtub anymore. You could do a one bedroom apartment with a great shower and that's really marketable. And this is uh, what we're building with one of our suburban 
um, communities, which is the indoor outdoor kitchen, which I just think is, is going to be a big hit. So live work. Live work for us has not worked. We keep trying. We keep redesigning. And it just it's, has not been marketable. I've talked to a number of different architects. I've talked to different management companies, Avalon Bay, which Avalon now, Archstone, etc. I don't have many examples. And so for us, it's going to be more about work. It's going to have those 27, in this case, Monroe Street Market, it's going to have work studios. You know, and I think this is a better way to go. And in D.C., there's many of these that the artists don't have a place to go. And so I think having that you know, right in town, that they have their work studio, but not the live work. And then for us, as I said, we haven't done it right. So we're going to hire a consultant. I think that's the only thing we can do in order to make this work. So we put aside $100,000 a year for this. Now this is close to 500, I think it's 575 units. But with their help, they'll help us with the retail, help us with some public art, you know, even some of our functional pieces. So this, is, uh, this kind of gives you an idea of, we've got 55 communities under development right now. Again, it's sort of our footprint. Um, and I think I'm going to, because of time, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brian, because I think you're going to want to hear from him, um, certainly because he's going to tell you how to do this. But there's one example I wanted to get to, and that was 360 State, because I think it is very interesting. And so this is in New Haven. Um, this is 500 units, and this was done by Becker and Becker, an architect, and it was an RFP, and they did win this. Um, plenty of green features. It's designed to meet um, lead platinum. But what's interesting is it has a 400 kilowatt fuel cell. It was the first in the country to do this. It's the first residential building. Um, what they expect is that the residents will get 50% savings on their electricity, but it's, in the, it's interesting right now because the state won't let them sell the electricity. And so now they have this 400 kilowatt fuel cell in the building, but the state doesn't want them to become a utility company. And so we're kind of stuck. But I love that, you know, in some respects, that Becker and Becker just decided this is what we wanted to do. And they also didn't use the developer, like companies like us, to determine what they wanted. Maybe this, maybe, maybe not such a smart decision right now knowing what happened. But certainly, at looking at their unit mix and some of the things that they did, they didn't pay attention to us where we kind of do a derivative of the old, and they actually kind of blew it out. And I really appreciated that they did that, including, again, their unit mix, which their average is about 638. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Um, location is still critical. Design is very important. Um, we're not even talking about the outside of your building, but that, of course, uh, you have to pay attention to as well. And I thank you. Thank you. Did you get through? No, you, you go through about as many slides as Jeff Speck goes through in a presentation. Very impressive. I'm going to talk about the construction and design of multifamily buildings, and in particular, uh, cost implications. One of the reasons this session is being put on because uh, questions were asked in the when, when the senior asked for topics, people said, "Why do so many multifamily buildings look so ugly?" So part of this session is to answer that question. First thing you should understand about housing is that from single-family housing to large-scale uh, high-rise housing is a very uh, disparate cost differential. At the single-family level, it's cut off, but that's about $85 a square foot, plus or minus, at that end of the spectrum, all the way up to $200 a square foot and, and above. But in between, depending on what type of housing, the height, the kinds of construction that is used, uh, you can find a variety of different price points and um, 
uh, different kinds of uh, accessibility, if you will. You know, there are some markets where you just won't be, wouldn't be able to afford these buildings, but you might be able to afford uh, this multifamily building, but you can't afford this. So that's an important thing that one needs to understand when you see certain buildings going up in certain markets. Um, for example, um, th this is a beautiful building in Washington, D.C. called the Lacey by Division I Architects. Um, but because it's steel and concrete, this building's roughly around $250 a foot, double the cost of the building we're working on, the, the Petworth Mixed Use Safeway, which is a, a wood, a podium project in, in, in Washington. Um, another cost item that you should all understand a little bit is the unit mix. If you have fewer unit types, you can, it's repetitive, it's easier to build, it, it gets done quicker, uh, as opposed to uh, a building that has a, more variety in it. And, and in fact, this building had so many units, we, we designed the facades originally um, with units in mind, and then we realized that we could reduce a few units, and it turned out to be cheaper to, to reduce a few units and move the walls and have some jogs at the end, unfortunately, right at the, at the, at the front facade of the building to, to make it pencil. So we were able to take out two or three unit, uh, uh, unit uh, versions of the one bedroom. Um, another big aspect of what people want today, as Jamie was talking to, is uh, the amenities. And I'm not going to get into this because Jamie covered this well, but we, we talk a lot today about mini Cooper units, that it's about really high amenity, smaller spaces. And so this kitchen, which was only done 10 years ago, uh, with the plastic laminate and the white refrigerators and appliances, is um, so out that they're probably going to have to redo these kitchens. Uh, in the market they're in, in order to make this uh, meet the market desires. Uh, and this is suburban Washington. I won't describe the project. Um, another big cost item is roof, is the roof structure. Uh, a reason you uh, multifamily developers tend to want to use in, in the wood construction uh, large roof trusses, which save money on the, roo on the roofs, and, and shingle construction. Um, so these two buildings on the right are attempts to um, riff on that need and that desire to keep the prices down. Uh, this one takes the trusses out a little bit and extends them. This one does some j jogs in the facade in, to, to resolve what is a cost consideration roof design. Um, ground plane access. It does cost more money to provide stoops and, and then certainly to have retail at the ground floor if, you, if there's a market for it, as opposed to those who, this one actually does have doors, but there's just a single door and there's a fence. It does, there's really not a lot spent here. And this one has no doors at the ground floor, even though it's theoretically in a walkable place. And that is a, a cost that's for, for all, I, I could say it's for cost. It may just be for ignorance. Um, another huge cost item that challenges the public realms we devise with multifamily buildings are mechanical systems. There are um, a couple of mechanical systems that have to go through the walls of our building. You can see this one actually goes through the cornice, this PTAC unit here. Uh, these are uh, magic pack units that you've probably seen around. Um, if you use a split system, you can put the, the, the part of the mechanical unit that breathes up on the roof. Uh, we rarely see central systems in multifamily, if you didn't know that. So this is a project we've worked on many years ago that got completed by another architect in New Jersey, uh, in Harrison, that sh uh, does a pretty good job of hiding the PTAC units behind grills. Uh, this is a design I, we've recently completed outside of Washington that tries to hide the PTACs uh, carefully in the skin. Um, these are two uh, Magic Pack buildings. This one here, you can see that you know this should be a central pedimented building, but they've put the PTAC right there. I'm sorry, the Magic Pack right there, and there's a Magic Pack there and this pier, but this one doesn't have it. It's really kind of odd, and you see this a lot in multifamily construction. What we've did in the um, City Vista project is, if you look closely, these little joints here are places to hide the Magic Packs in the shadows, so and in, and in the balconies as well. So all these balconies that are inset have the multi magic pack tucked inside the, the, the joint. Uh, another challenge to facade design are, is uh, venting for uh, kitchens as well as for um, uh, washer dryers or dryers. And you'll see the vents come out the side, or you can hardly make it on the slide here, but there's some, this, this floor is coming out on the roof. Um, some architects use it as a device to organize a more mechanical looking building like David Baker did uh, out west. 
Um, in other buildings, we're fortunate enough to, this is a mixed use building with retail on the ground floor where there are, again, condensers on the roof. And then there are these wells that we put on the back. So this is on top of the concrete podium, so you don't have to carry the structure of the mechanical and the structure of the wood construction. But uh, these wells here, are right behind a wall here, this is the courtyard in between. But what it allows you to do is avoid having any of the P-TACs or the mechanical, uh, the magic pack grills or the vents on the facade of the building. Um, more and more we're being asked to provide more glass to the units. Uh, you can see that this, this, this slide was made to show how much more you can see with, with glass in, in the design. And we try to find ways of not only doing it in mo more modern facades, it's pretty simple to just create a, a glass wall, um, but also looking at ways of incorporating not only in traditional facade buildings, but in wood buildings as well. This is a wood, this is in construction, the windows going into a wood frame building. Uh, and here's a finished building. This is uh, another one under construction in wood with lots of glass, floor to ceiling. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what we'll call unfortunate design decisions. Um, a lot of the decisions that are tabulated in the next part of the presentation could be resolved with a quick study of Steve Muzan's great book, Traditional Construction Patterns. Which really, there's, if you open the book, and I'm sure it's in the book shop, it has the do's and don'ts on each page. Um, uh, but some we called, I'll call this dipped in brick. This is where developers and used to just, they would say, well, we, if you could touch it, we want it to be brick, but if it's up higher, we can be whatever you want, the cheapest material possible. The good news is that no one's doing this anymore, or that, that we know of anyway. Maybe they're doing it in China. Again, plastic palladium is pretty much out, except in China. Um, but the next wave is sort of, uh, I don't even know what to call this, sort of Tetris design maybe, but this is, a lot of this is going on right now by the same architects that were doing the plastic palladium. Um, another challenge that Steve talks about in his book um, are wacky window proportions or proportions in general. This is an amazing project and it would be, I mean, it's got a, a market and a, an Einstein bagel and all these great retails and a view of the mountains in the distance and then it's got these really awkwardly shaped windows here that, that sort of take away from the quality of the place. And this building is almost as simple and it's the window proportions that carry it in many ways. Um, another challenge is what we call thin returns where you know, something that's meant to be solid and, 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 and massive, just don't turn the corner. Uh, and, and you can do this in a creative way. I, I put a picture here of Virgil Exner, who designed the 57 line for Chrysler, where he worked against Harley Earl's design of the big, fat, bulbous cars at the time by exposing the edges of the metal. He said, no, we're going we're gonna to expose that these are made out of sheet metal. Uh, and it was a radical des design decision. And one could do that in architecture as well. But this just simply isn't considered, and it looks cheap. Uh, another challenge uh, is uh, what's been called lick and stick uh, versus big monoliths. Uh, the monolith building, this is actually a Sylvia building. This is a, in Pripyat, the, the town next to Chernobyl that was abandoned. Uh, the, the one here is actually a very well detailed and with a building with great materials, but the facades aren't really anchored, and so there's a few, uh, too many of them, if you will, that just don't have enough purpose for their being. And it, and, it, and it simplifies, and, 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 and uh, this is a great architect who, I used to work for this firm, and they, they just uh, missed the boat a little bit on this one. Uh, um, what we try to do is consider the urban increment uh, carefully in our buildings. I mean, these buildings, uh, we, we didn't talk about this until now, but uh, t to get a multifamily built today, multifamily building built today, you need about 200 units in a building. And that's a big building. And if you're doing it in three stories over one, as the, as the codes used to require, and I'll talk about codes in a second, it, it's, it's a monster building. This is one asset. And to make good urbanism out of it, you have to find ways of breaking it down. So this particular building, we created two blocks out of it. So you look at it, it looks like there's a street here that runs through the middle. And then each corner is a separate facade identity. Um, so there's the, this one here, this hotel. They lost a hotel in this jurisdiction. They wanted to get replaced. And then the three other identities marching down this street that uh, are respectful of sort of the grain of this particular uh, jurisdiction. So now I'm going to go through the types of multifamily housing that, they're, that, that are getting, that have been built recently. Um, there's a whole range of housing that's out there. And there's 
uh, parking solutions that go with them. Generally, if it's more suburban, it can be surface parked. If you're really urban, it can be underground or served by transit. Uh, and there's all sorts of solutions in between. Um, uh, the, the tallest, I'm going to start from the top and go down because it's more tricky at the other end, obviously are type one buildings. And with type one, you can do all sorts of fun things like cantilevers, uh, cantilevered cornices, you know, planes that stick out. It's really kind of exciting. This is for Vornado in Arlington. And that's why it's got the big V in it, although that went away. Um, these are some other uh, high-rise type one buildings on our boards right now. Um, and then I'm stepping down to what's 5A podium. And this was built, the codes recently are, were clarified, where it used to be uh, the, the interpretation was three floors of wood over one floor of type one concrete for the podium. But now they've, the codes have started to stay that for mixed use buildings that you can have four stories of wood for type 5A construction over one. And if you're very tricky and clever about it, you can actually make a fifth floor uh, by creating a mezzanine that's still not counted as a floor, but as another uh, as another floor. So this is this looks like five stories over one, but it's really a five A building. It's it is still limited to seventy foot in the five A, and and this is actually very tricky. And, and these what you do is you really compress the top two floors. It's a great question where you, you grapple with when you try to do this. Absolutely true. Typically with with wood stick construction. You are uh, you try to stay to ten foot eight floor to floor as you know, and um, with type one concrete construction you can go much finer uh, depths you know, nine eight or so because the floor the construction for the slab can be less. So oftentimes in certain jurisdictions with he with height limits like Washington D.C. you'll find concrete uh, more concrete construction to get an extra floor in the height limits. Um, there's a type of construction called 3A, and this was intended as the um, masonry construction type, sort of the monadnock type, where the perimeter walls were masonry and then wood was suspended between the floors. But what's happened is that people started, developers and architects realized it would be cheaper to build the perimeter masonry wall out of wood. So it's become a, 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 a hybrid type, if you will, of uh, balloon construction with fall away slat floors. Um, that, and what this does is get you another potential floor of construction under the codes. And again, this, is a, this happens to be 3A podium, so it's 5 over 1. Uh, and then when you get going down the spectrum, the, uh, the wood buildings can be uh, what they call Texas Donuts. They wrap the, the parking load. Uh, typically, you'll have arms that come off that are double loaded because if you just did it as a single loaded building, it would be too inefficient and would not get financed. This is uh, Addison here in Texas, and this is King Farm, one of ours. And, and, and the, the point of this is that you don't see your parking from the public realm. This is Monument Place in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, and then there are quarter type buildings. Uh, these, this, these are out in uh, Loudoun County, um, which uh, sur you know, have suburban parking lots behind buildings that then frame public realms. Uh, one step down from there are walk up buildings where there are you know, a stair that leads you to a, a small vestibule, and there's certain height limits that you can see uh, for these kinds of buildings. Uh, and then uh, we're, what we're trying to get to here is what, what was called recently in an article by Better Cities and Towns, the missing middle of housing. There's all these types that haven't really been built as much lately, mainly because of the asset sizes. The developers and institutional investors want 200 unit buildings. and that these types that are described here, duplexes, triplexes, bungalow courts, townhouses, are, tend to be smaller than that. And that's a challenge. It's unlikely that these types will be revived in the, multi, in the multifamily rental world, although we're hopeful that in the condo world, these will come back because they're easier increments to get developed and built w with our challenges in, in, in the world today. So, but some of the reasons that the missing middle is happening is just for zoning. This is a project in Connecticut where uh, I was looking at. Uh, where the zone was a, a single-family zone right next to this mixed-use district, but they didn't, they zoned out all these housing products. It was crazy. So you, you get, uh, you, you would get a, a very sh a strange shift from single-family to big, large buildings without a decent segue between the two of them. And in America, this happens a lot because of zoning. Uh, in Australia, it's very interesting, this happens because of the fire codes, that they don't allow wood multifamily buildings of certain sizes. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a strange problem that we have in our overregulation. Uh, um, but there are some 
mis middle buildings happening, unfortunately, they're not very nice. And when they start to get built and, get, and proliferate, the communities start uh, screaming in an uproar. This is what's called the Bayonne Box. Is anyone from New Jersey here? Okay, this is a uh, two-store, this is a two-unit uh, product that originated in Bayonne, New Jersey, and when it started to get trans, uh, when it started to transfer to Newark and the Ironbound neighborhood, the community had a fit, and basically Cory Booker, uh, before he was saving his neighbors from fire, was uh, fought to outlaw these types. And it's unfortunate because it's also outlawing other types that would be reasonable, like the Charleston type. These are a three-unit uh, building type that we have built uh, in King Farm uh, with uh, Prisk Pritzker development. And uh, uh, again, you have three garages in the back and three separate units built into this frame, this chassis of a building. It's also been built um, in Baldwin Park in Florida as well the, as a two-unit product. Um, and then there's a project we, product we call the Manor Houses, which is simply one piece of a walk-up. So it's a nine-unit uh, piece that uh, acts just like a regular walk-up building, except the walk-up building would replicate this over and over again. We use this in the corners. So you have Charleston's in the middle of this block and then the, the Manor House types at the corners. Uh, an another type, and this is an exciting project f for us because this was done by a private sector developer. Um, uh, this was done with Avalon. Uh, this is a project called Avalon uh, Arlington Arna Valley. I think they've taken the Arna Valley out, uh, Valley out of the name now. But it has LiveWorks in it. It has two over twos here, which are these products. So you go up the stair, and there are two doors there. One door that leads you up to this unit, and another door that leads you here and down to this unit. And they have garages behind. And it makes a wonderful f uh, community. Uh, and this is the core for a community that also contains a Texas donut running off that side. So it, it, it's rich with the population that the Texas Donut provides, but also the place that this type uh, in, engenders. Um, the uh, English basements are a type that are, are reviving. These two are built in Columbus. Uh, this is in Liberty Harbor uh, by uh, Robert Orr, who's in another session right now. Um, uh, the Live Works at Kentlands obviously deserve mention. Um, so what, what I want to talk about a little bit was sort of the orchestration of typological design, how you take all these types and hopefully find a way to put them together so we can get 200 units to make something that would appeal to the, uh, the institutional investors of the world. Um, and, and this has happened, although it hasn't really happened much in the private sector world. Where it's happened is in military housing and in the Hope Six world. Um, so, so with military housing, where you're... Where you, it's been driven by the differentiation required, differentiation required by pay grades. You can't have a general in the same house a private lives in. Um, and so what that's done is allowed uh, uh, architects such as ourselves uh, to create neighborhoods that have a variety of types, variety of housing types here and actually mixed use types here uh, that meet that, that huge matrix of uh, housing demand that's required by a military project. Um, both of these, incidentally, are CNU award winners from the past. This is a, a Hope Six project in Cincinnati, which can, which gets its diversity from the d demand that the developers uh, provide both replacement housing for those uh, public housing folks who were in, on the site before, as well as provide uh, for sale housing as part of an overall integrated community, and that helps create diversity and, and vibrancy. Uh, we've been able to do this kind of mixing uh, with student housing or more, more student faculty housing. Uh, there are townhouses in here mixed with walk-ups. So these are stacked flats in these, project, in these units here. But again, it frames an, a public realm that is uh, neighborhood-like as opposed to uh, project-like, I guess would be the best way to describe the alternate -tiv. Uh, We talked about that already. Uh, this is another, uh, this is King Farm again, and what happens is you can start to use the different housing types agglomerated together to create urbanism, so that the types then lead to place. Uh, and when you start thinking this way, you can then come, start to devise new types that start to meet needs that you otherwise wouldn't have realized were there. This is Baldwin Park done for David Pace, who is talking somewhere else, I think, right now. Um, uh, this is for the new Broad Street Development Group and Pritzker uh, at Baldwin Park. Uh, this is a main retail drag here, and then there are residential neighborhoods that come around the perimeter. This part of the plan here and here 
is the parking load for this retail core. And what we realize is that if you just design it with this retail core and a parking here, there'd be very little connection between the housing and, 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 and the main, main drag. So there was these types that we came up with that day one could be residential but could convert into the future to retail. So as more houses were built out here, um, the program which only really would fill the retail space here day one could start to filter out this way with more commercial space to the edge places down these side streets here. And so this is the type, um, both naked and um, fully finished. Day one, the, 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 it starts out with re uh, two story units above and uh, one story residential units on the ground floor. These are knockout panels that you can, you can kick out and when it's when there's the market to convert this to commercial space, you can simply gut a portion of the bottom of the building or all of the bottom building to provide uh, doctor's offices, retail, whatever. Yeah. And so this is a, a vision of what it is now, what it could be in the future via Photoshop. So we, we take this and we've, you know, we've tr we've, we're trying to t develop community design, um, using the, a typological understanding in, in our projects. And this is one we have on, on the board somewhere north of here. I can't say where. Um, but again, this is ta in, in the center of the project, it ha it's creating the place that sells the vision of a walkable neighborhood. Um, a, the West Village, if you're a New Yorker, the, the Adams Morgan, if you're a DC, or the, the Lincoln Park, if you're a Chicago person. That's what this is intended to be. And it's lower scale, and it can be built cheaply because you need the money to pay for the, the, the amenities you're trying to provide there. So it starts with towns and, and two over twos. It has some of the, the, the Charleston product in this zone here. It then segues into uh, walk-ups and parking podium buildings, Texas Donuts, and to final high-rise at, at, at the end of it. And the, the idea is that, again, you phase from the, the less expensive, lower scale product uh, product, create the place fully, in, uh, uh, create the envelope around that room, uh, and then over time develop to the outer edges of it. And why this, this is, it's, it's both a nice planning gesture, but it's also smart business. Um, this is the con a diagram of the construction cost. Obviously the high rise buildings are the most expensive, and the least expensive are these at the center of the project. Um, in this community, there were, the rents they would get at this end are going to be higher than at this end, but we're starting in the middle. So what happens is the, uh, so the, the, the price they can get for rents will be higher at this end than, than down here. But what we found was that the profit spread is highest at the center. So they're starting in the place where they get the, the biggest profit spread. Some of that profit will go to pay for the amenities, but a lot of them go to the developer's park pocket to then uh, energize and fuel the absorption and the growth as the project moves on. And that's all I have to talk about today. So we have a period for questions, if anyone would like to uh, ask myself or, or, or Jamie. There's a couple reasons. One is when we're managing communities in order to, because of the cost, it just seems to be the breaking point is 200. If we can get 200. If you can get to 200, it makes economical sense because we can't, um, if it's less than that, you still have to get a manager and you have to have a service manager and you have costs. And it just doesn't make sense. And so that's why it has to get to about 200 in order for it to make sense for us. The question was, in downtown areas, do you find that that number is more flexible? And the answer is, in real down, in, in heart, in, in city core areas, that is true. That you can probably go down to 130 or so. 
but that becomes a, a management challenge and an institutional challenge. Institutional investors sometimes just have a boilerplate and they say, well, I don't want a project that's less than 175 to invest in. And that just, and that takes, it, it makes it harder to um, finance the, the projects. Yes, way in back. Um, yes, in Santa Monica. Yes, in um, in some parts of, of in, in the BART rail network of San Francisco, you can you can achieve that absolutely. It's just it's, it's m more challenged, and you need you need um, motivation for that. And also, it's a, a lot it tends a lot to be smaller condo developers that are that are doing those kinds of projects. Although some of them were supposed to be condo and then went rental too. There's a lot of that in the marketplace right now. Um, one response thing that came to my mind, memory when you said that. The part of the reason that, another reason why residential um, rental amenities have gone up is because so many projects that were started as condo f five years ago and had a higher level of amenities in them went rental and that became the basis of competition. So it's not, it's, you, can't get a, you can't get away with plastic laminate in the kitchens anymore because everyone is expecting granite and stainless. And to add to that, we're now seeing um, condos that went apartments that are now going back to condos. So what kind of experience have you had in, in getting uh, institutional investors to, to finance it, to uh, kind of move along from the sign, uh, I guess, look forward as opposed to looking to the past, talking about the sticks of bricks, and that's, that's over with the, the, I think, the thought process in, in the South. Both of us at this table are beholden to Petty, Penny Pritzker for being a uh, far-sighted investor, uh, both for a number of projects we worked on and now for a number of things that Pizzuto is working on today. So there are investors who, who do see forward, um, and you, you, you have to find. And, 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 there's, and they're seeing even further beyond that. I think there are other um, investor developers like Jonathan Rose, who, unlike Bazudo, ha, you know, likes the notion, and uh, we're working with them where they're putting LibWorks in their project. And they see that as something, as an amenity that they can, they understand how to sell it to their clientele in the suburban New York market. So, um, but, no, so that, so they are there. Yes. That's, I'm, I should have, I should have been more specific. Thank you for. Uh, making me clarify. Those are construction costs, primarily based on our knowledge of the Washington, D.C. market, although depending on where you are relative to Washington, you can shift it up or shift it down. Uh, so if, if that helps you answer. Hard cost construction, Washington market. Sure. Absolutely. As when I spoke in the very beginning and we talked about the consumer finding the best of the best, they are going to look wherever they, you know, deem is the best and that could be different products. So we're very concerned about that. Uh, that's a great question. It's built to commercial code up front, and then the residential is fit in like a tenant fit out for an office building. There are other projects, which I didn't show, that have been done um, that are full, full three, four story buildings built to an office standard with residential in it day one so that they can convert to office on the upper floors. Um, but the, this one in particular was a retail uh, ground floor conversion.
No, actually, it's a, it's a performance saver in many ways because what happens is sometimes communities require retail and what we've been able to do is go into certain communities and say, well, we'll, get, we'll, we'll make it so it can accommodate the retail when, the re when it's ready. When you have all the houses built and this becomes the place where retail should happen, it will happen. But for day one, to make our performer work, we want to be able to say it's residential. So it may cost a little bit more from a construction standpoint for that concrete slab and the other improvements you have to make to take it to the commercial code. It saves the performer. It, makes, it, it, it frees up uh, cash from things you don't see in the building to the things you do see, to the facades and to the public realm. Uh, mea culpa. I, it, it's hard to, uh, it's a, it's a ge let's call it a general swag for the, for the housing type exclusive of the parking. I could give a, I can give you a whole presentation on the different, and have given presentations on, on the parking types and what they do to the, to the project. The, the, the biggest challenge to residential performance today is parking. And if you give me a second to talk about this since we're on it. Um, jurisdictions that require, like in Los Angeles, two spaces per unit in places where you have to structure parking or go underground are effectively putting a cost per unit of $100,000 onto the cost of that unit. Whereas a kitchen will cost $15,000, a bathroom might cost $7,000. The cost of that parking underground is $100,000, and it's ridiculous. And it's, and it's, and it's in, for affordable housing, it's killing the potential for housing all across the United States. So there's my soapbox comment for you all. Yeah, no, it's a, the, the, we, we. Our, our parking ratios are going down and we're fine with that. And I would tell you if it wasn't, uh, you know, I have to pay attention to the voice of the customer. And we're seeing buildings where it's not the usual ratio and we're going, you know, it's a smaller ratio, 0.5, whatever. And we've got the zip car and you're near transit or even if you're not, that ratio is going down unless people are buying cars or sharing cars. And this is a knowledge question. We just don't have the information to fully understand what the real parking needs are in TOD places. Yes. That's Houston, yeah. That makes sense. Well, to add to that too, what, what bothers me with these, you know, 0.75 or one to one ratio is that our unit mix has changed. We've got more studios and more ones. So we need less cars. And then we have some of the same sort of, you know, we have to have one to one or 1 1.75 or whatever it might be. And you're not really looking at what is the demand for that unit, a studio, which is 0.3 or a uh, one bedroom, which is 0.5. two key lessons that should be repeated from what you said are A, it was unbundling that helped 
free up the, the situation, and B, then they establish market pricing on the parking. By, um, you unbundle first, and then you establish market pricing. And once you have the market pricing in place, we can then begin to figure out what the real demands are. But uh, one of, one of, I had a panel for the CNU in Austin on parking demand. It was a 202, and we had Mary Smith there who wrote the shared parking standards. And the most amazing thing she said was that the only two categories in the entire world that we actually have good statistical data on for parking are A, suburban office buildings at three per thousand, and uh, regional shopping centers at four and a half per thousand. Everything else is a swag. And so we all need to, to understand that and, and don't take them, for, and obviously Donald Shope's book, um, uh, it talks to those issues, the high, pri the high price of free parking. Jeff? I'll tell you, and um, I'm not going to answer you directly because I don't. I'll give you one example of something that we ran into an issue when we were building, and there was a parking garage right next to us, and we were building condos. And, uh, and well, I actually went to apartments. but So we have a parking garage that's next to us. We don't want to build all the spaces. We tried to work with them. It was owned by Giant. We couldn't work with them. So here we didn't even want to build it. And we actually thought we could we could convince um, you know J P Morgan we could convince all the players we couldn't get Giant to work with us. I do believe that. I think you can't do it on for sale. That was a disaster from the beginning. But I think on the apartment side, absolutely. And then to give you another example, we built a building where they required us to build um, 1,245 spaces a public garage, and it's one of the most successful apartment communities from the rent side and absorption, that garage has sucked the wind out of us. I mean, we're losing about a million dollars a year from the garage, which we were required to do. Yeah. Another example of that, as many of you might know, is, is the work we did at Columbia Heights. On the residential side, uh, we the banks were demanding, right at a metro station, were demanding one per th one space per unit. We pushed back hard. A developer ba was saying that, no, no, we could, we, we'll, we'll, do it, we'll, we'll do it a little less. And finally, they got to one, uh, 0 0.75, and the actual usage is 0.4. So half the spaces in that garage are sitting empty. For all the retail in Columbia Heights with the residential, um, I think there's something like 700 spaces that sit empty. Um, retail is based, the parking for retail is based on peak loads, and the peak load is generally the second Saturday in December. I, I deliberately go to DC USA the second Saturday in December and 2 o'clock in the afternoon to see what the re how much parking is being used in that garage. And if you go to the lower level of that garage, it sits empty. Okay. Are, are there any last non-parking questions we have regarding multifamily housing? All right. Well, good work, good work. Go ahead. Uh, no, the condo market stopped, but there are small developers that are potentially filling the we're, we're, We see a few small developers coming, young, young kids basically, who are sort of half construction, half finance think, thinking guys coming out of college looking to do something, and they're self-developing or renovating. Uh, and they could end up being the developers that re bring back these types more as a condo product into the, as they get, as the banks get more confidence in them as, as, as we move forward. Well, I, was it last week, I think Beezer is now in the rental market? which they were in it, then they were out it, out of it, now they're back in it. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Um, Donald Shope, his book is uh, high, The High Cost of Free Parking. It's on the shelf in the bookstore. 
the other book I mentioned was for traditional construction details, which is about the, the do's and the don'ts of, of exterior design. That's Steve Muzan's uh, traditional uh, construction patterns, I believe is the name of that book. If there's another book, you can come talk to me and we'll try to figure out what, what you're... Thank you. <laughs>